Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the in-house council forum. I am Anuj Shah, a partner in Khaitan's Singapore office and part of corporate M&A group at Khaitan & Company. It's truly an honor to have each of us, each of you join us. In-house council forum is an initiative of Khaitan & Company designed as a private learning and discussion forum for in-house council teams in India. We have specifically structured this program to include not only topics of substantive law, but also management and other topics which we believe would be highly relevant for in-house councils. Our objective with this initiative is to address matters pertinent to all members of in-house council community including general counsel, chief legal officers, and other team members. Our goal is to serve as a platform that facilitates exchange of ideas and best practices from which in-house counsel teams may benefit. Uh, we could go to the webinar agenda. On uh, on this slide, you'll find the agenda for today's webinar. In summary, we will begin with an interview with our special guest, Dr. Catherine McGregor, followed by a Q&A session where we will address audience questions. We encourage you to actively participate and to ask questions as we go along. We have already received several audience questions, and if you have one, please submit it using the webinar portal. In the event we are unable to cover all the questions during the webinar, we will ensure that we respond offline via email after the session. The summary notes of the webinar will be sent to you following the session as a matter of course. Uh, let me provide you a quick introduction to today's webinar. In today's VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, in-house council teams have an uphill task to operate within a dynamic and continually evolving environment. As India continues to grow and Indian companies spread their wings to seize new opportunities, the responsibility of in-house council teams has increased substantially to support their business teams in helping their companies meet their objectives and to help business teams in balancing opportunities and risks. In-house teams are continually challenged to adapt and excel to support the growth of their companies. Effective corporate counsel establish robust relationships with their business counterparts and not only comprehend but empathize with the business challenges they encounter. The increase, this increasingly necessitates a more holistic approach to their work grounded in a deeper understanding of business operations. Beyond their traditional legal roles, many in-house counsel find themselves tasked with and successfully performing additional business functions. This slide, which you have on screen, illustrates a range of business functions undertaken by in-house counsel respondents to a 2024 Association of Corporate Counsel survey. As you will note, a significant portion of respondents are engaged in at least three uh, additional functions. Corporate councils are increasingly expected to transcend their conventional legal roles and also assume business responsibilities, requiring them to adopt new approach towards doing things. For these and various other reasons, embracing a business oriented mindset is crucial for in-house councils. And, and this is what underscores the importance of today's webinar. Go to the next slide. It, uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that I introduce our distinguished guest for
for today's webinar, Dr. Catherine McGregor. Dr. McGregor brings a wealth of expertise to our discussion. As a seasoned consultant, executive coach, and an accomplished author, Dr. McGregor's insights into the in-house counsel community are unparalleled. Her extensive experience spans interactions with several in-house counsels across the globe, including legal departments within many Fortune 500 companies and FTSE 250 companies. Additionally, her tenure in senior positions at Chambers and Partners and GC Magazine have provided her with a unique perspective on engaging with general counsels in various contexts. Of particular relevance to today's discussion uh, is the fact that Dr. McGregor is the author of Business Thinking in Practice for In-House Counsel. Uh, uh, author of this book titled Business Thinking in Practice for In-House Counsel, Taking Your Seat at the Table, which I believe is a seminal work that addresses critical aspects of the role of a corporate in-house counsel. Welcome, Dr. McGregor. We are truly Thanks. delighted to we are truly delighted to have you join us today. In preparing for today's webinar, I had the privilege of reading your insightful book, uh, and uh, I wanted to mention that I felt it was truly a masterpiece that should be essential reading for all in-house counsels. Even for those of us who are in private practice, I found numerous invaluable insights that resonated deeply on how we can serve our clients better. With that, it's truly a pleasure and let's kick off this discussion. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mantrika, a bulk of our discussions today will be around business thinking mm -hmm. and how in-house teams can think, uh, imbibe business thinking to actions that they perform. But before we get there, uh, there's a lot of emphasis in your book around purpose. You go on to say in one of the chapters that purpose not only has a strong overlap with leadership, but also with talent development and talent management. And you say that this is something you consistently receive feedback from many general counsel that how they struggle uh, to, to align talent uh, with purpose. Uh, maybe I thought it may be a good way to start our discussion as we move towards business thinking. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, certainly, Anuj. And uh, and I, I mean, I think purpose is essentially the starting point of, of many uh, business insights. Um, and that's one of the reasons it was the business uh, piece of thinking that I, I start my book with. Um, Peter Drucker, who is the father of modern management theory, always felt that if a company did not have a purpose, it was not serving a human need. Um, and he very much was very clear that um, profitability was not an adequate purpose. Profitability is a side effect of having um, a a, a purpose that connects with people and serves their needs. So frankly, if you're doing something successfully and satisfying your customers, whether they're B2B, B2C, whatever, then profitability will, will follow. Um, I think that that also, though, um, is true for um, your employees, um, your talent. And we know that certainly generationally, um, the younger generations, sort of millennials and, and Gen Z, are very focused on purpose and actually perhaps less focused on uh, financial rewards. Um, and indeed, I think that, you know, both in-house departments and law firms, certainly, that I work with struggle somewhat to um, keep young people, uh, younger talent motivated. Um, so the connection to purpose is, I think, very key. And certainly just to take a step back for a moment, um, thinking about what the actual purpose of your legal department is in relation to the business um, has been quite transformative for many of the general counsel I've worked with and many of the general counsel who um, are featured as case studies is my book. In one case, um, the Pearson Legal Department, um, which feature in my case study on culture and, uh, you know, aligning the culture of the legal department with the culture of the business very successfully. Their starting point was actually a purpose question and the general counsel 
asked his legal team, you know, if the CEO turned around to me tomorrow and said, you know, why shouldn't I outsource the legal team? Why do I need an internal legal team? What would your answer be? So that was really a way for his legal team to start the thinking around what is the unique perspective we bring? What is the unique thing we give? And their answer was very much around um, the um, knowledge that they could bring, that the in-depth um, knowledge that they could bring that an external provider could not. Um, and then the, um, the pragmatism that they could bring as well, which was um, an exact byproduct of that in-depth insider knowledge of the company that, you know, there was frankly skin in the game for them because they were colleagues, they weren't just external um, objective counsel. Um, and I think for, uh, in terms of uh, attracting and retaining talent, there have been a number of studies that show that teams that are aligned around a purpose will be more successful, will be more engaged. And some of that is frankly around the fact that businesses are undergoing a lot of change, more change than ever before. And that's only increasing. We're all, I'm sure, hearing about the advent of generative AI in our businesses. It's still early days. We still don't know exactly what it will do. It will have ramifications for talent. Things will change. May well, um, may well indeed be um, positive, but people, there's a lot of fear around that as well. There's a lot of high emotions. And I do think that, um, you know, in this time of change, consistently connecting the change back to the purpose. This is why we are doing this. This is why we are changing. And whether that's something massive, you're actually introducing a huge legal department transformation, maybe as part of a wider business transformation. Maybe it's something very small, but can still feel quite massive to people. You're actually introducing um, a time management system for your in-house lawyers so that you can look at, you know, where they're spending their time. Is there, is there too much, uh, you know, overlap of what people are doing? It could be a small change, but, you know, psychologically that could be huge. But for people to understand why that change is taking place, what the purpose is, can just get them on your side and indeed make it much easier. Absolutely. Well, that's, uh, that's I think, uh, very informative. I was actually, I, I had read it in school, but forgotten, but I found that anecdote in your book where you give an example of uh, John, the President Kennedy visiting the NASA Space Center and he runs into a janitor and he asks the janitor, what's your role? And he says, President, my role is to put people on moon. Yeah, uh, and and this is something we used to discuss a lot in Khetan as well at some point in yeah. time. Uh, that look, what is our purpose? Uh, you know, to, to serve yeah. the uh, in-house counsels and to serve the clients. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I thought I, I, I thought uh, we we fully agree, and you know that was uh, uh, good feedback. Now let's get dive into the key topic of our discussion today which is business thinking. Now, there's a lot of discussion these days that look, in-house teams need to wear business hat, they have to have business thinking. And my question to you is, what do you exactly mean by business thinking? Mm. Well, I actually mean a couple of different things. Well, I say different, they're very much related. So on the bigger picture sense, it is really having um, a very strong alignment with what your business is doing and understanding what their strategy is, what the strategy of the C-suite is, and seeing how everything you are doing in legal contributes to that. Um, and often taking the inquiries a bit further to um, maximize the insights you're getting within the legal department to see how they can actually help the business um, and it's almost like in many of the, the I work with a number of uh, coaching clients who are maybe approaching their first GC role they've just taken their first general counsel role and I like to use the concept or the metaphor rather of, of a camera lens um, or a telescope um, the telescope can, you know, be give us a massive wide view if it's one of those, you know, uh, uh, space type telescopes it could give us a view of the entire night sky 
um, but it can also go into sort of great detail. But the power for business thinking is being able to see the big picture and being able to zoom in when necessary, but always zooming out again to connect it to the big picture. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the business thinking um, in the other aspect, the uh, topics that I focused on in the book are business thinking ideas that have been very um, popular with business over, say, the past 20 years in terms of really changing the way that many businesses operate. So the idea of purpose, the idea of culture, um, the idea of really, you know, looking at leadership as a skill set, which frankly, um, you know, until about sort of 25 years ago, wasn't as big a focus now the market for leadership development books on leadership absolutely exploded and in the same way that um, business leaders are having to think about these things i think that the most successful general counsel chief legal officers will also be thinking about these aspects in relation to their legal teams because um, the way that you're running your legal team needs to really reflect the concerns of your wider organization. Your team is going to be more successful. Um, you're going to be more aligned with key stakeholders. They're going to actually see that, um, you know, you're, you're fighting for the same objectives. And some of it is very, I think, very instrumental in getting past some of the old stereotypes that the legal department is the department of no, that they are a blocker, or that they're the people we bring in at the end just to get the sign off on the contract. Um, that is unfortunately an old fashioned point of view, but I'm sure there may be many companies, many uh, people on this call who are still suffering from that in their companies. Um, and I think that the more that you can be thinking about the bigger perspective of the business, the more that you can change the mindset and become more aligned in the way you work and literally then be able to uh, take your seat at the table. Um, and in one of my first case studies um, in the book, which was with uh, Rob Booth at the Crown Estate, um, he turned up with a very strongly defined sense of purpose, which was completely aligned to uh, the business objectives of the Crown Estate. And his new purpose statement for his legal um, department was that his legal team would give the Crown Estates um, a sustainable and competitive advantage. So his aim is completely aligned to the success of the business. And actually a big part of how he did that was through increasing collaboration with uh, the business, with um, ensuring that he brought business leaders in to talk to his team, bringing his team out to talk to um, other departments, fostering that sense of understanding and of frankly shared purpose and, and shared objectives. And interestingly enough, um, he actually left his uh, general counsel role at the, the Crown Estate to go and run their, um, their wind farm business, so which was actually propelled into a business role. So, um, you know, potentially a success story if that was something you wanted. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, and I think. Even one of the examples I read in the book was of a company called Network Rail, where the CEO mm -hmm. would, uh, so where the GC would ensure uh, and tell his team that, look, we need to go out and spend time with business guys. And I should tell you, even my experience of working with several in-house counsels over the last 20 years that I've been in private practice, I have seen this again and again, that there are GCs who understand businesses so well uh, and they bring disproportionate value uh, to all the mm. discussions. Mm. Would you like to, can I invite you to also give some more examples uh, on business thinking uh, by in-house counsel and what were the key factors that contributed to the success in those cases? Yeah, no, for example, and, and the network rail example is a great one, Anoush, because it, um, it it very much, um, network rail, um, it, if anyone doesn't know, is the sort of the organization in the United Kingdom that runs the infrastructure of the railways. So this actually involved the lawyers from the legal team, you know, putting on their high-vis jackets and, and going out onto railway tracks at nighttime when 
the the workers were repairing it and aside from showing um you know great collaboration and and, and uh, inducing a sense of collegiality the lawyers did tell me that it gave them a greater understanding of many of the issues that they, they were being asked to weigh in on because they could actually see you know how things were coming up and, and what it actually meant and I think that that's um, very very um, important um, in terms of you know getting um, engendering that uh, that business thinking mindset in yourself and your team um, I mean some other um, examples of, of business uh, thinking in action um, would be um, uh, the uh, uh, the example of, of DXC Technologies, where um, they were undergoing um, a, a radical transformation as a company, um, had to cut costs, had to completely change their operating model. Um, so the general counsel, Bill Deckelman, decided that rather than, um, you know, sort of fight this, he would actually embrace it and jump absolutely wholeheartedly into doing the same thing as his um, as his business was, was being forced to do. And in some cases, go almost even further. Um, and many of you may remember that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of focus in the DXC technology um, United Lex tie up a few years ago in the legal press. And this was really um, a very um, sophisticated um, outsourcing um, model where many of the um, historically internal legal staff would be re-employed by the outsourcer so that um, legal work could be managed much more effectively and that increased cost savings could could be applied, but that also an increased digital transformation project could be applied across the um, organization because on their own, they did not have the resources or the, um, uh, you know, the money to apply this themselves. So through the partnership with the outsourcing um, provider, they were able to, um, you know, become a very, very sophisticated, digitized uh, legal department. And again, on similar lines, we continue to see this a sea change even in the Indian market uh, and with corporate council groups within Indian conglomerates. And I see the sea change where legal departments, which would earlier primarily have the mindset to do pure legal work and advise only from a legal perspective, are now adopting business thinking strategy, aligning with overall objectives of the firm what do you think and you say you and i had uh, uh, side discussions and you mentioned that you see this theme across even developed countries elsewhere what is driving this uh, what is driving this change i think it's the in, honestly um, it's the increasing complexity of modern business and the increasing um uh, the increasing occurrence of risk events, which are more and more complex. I mean, if you look at um, statistics from McKinsey and people like that, the occurrence of crisis events in companies has increased exponentially. It's a result of globalization, a result of you know increased communications and so forth, um, in, in increased innovation as well. But what we're seeing with, I think, the role of the general counsel and the chief legal officer is a realization um, that actually it's not just about law, it's about risk in managing risk in a much more um, sophisticated sense. You know, there are a number of dimensions of business risk of which legal risk is just one. But I think that the best general counsel and indeed the best in-house lawyers, it's not confined just to general counsel or CLOs, have that sophisticated understanding of all of the other aspects of, of legal risk, of, of business risk, sorry, and how it overlaps with legal risk. And I mean, we just see that many of the issues that indeed many of you may be facing, such as cyber attacks, 
um, cyber security issues, they're not just purely legal issues, or indeed we look at what's going on in the world. Many of the issues that you know businesses are facing are down to geopolitical risks, such as the issues with Israel and Palestine and Ukraine and Russia. Um, we've got to think about things in a much more multifaceted way, and increasingly the legal departments have to think about things in a much more multifaceted way. Um, I've seen a number of examples where actually general counsel have um, got into some quite dire straits and, and you know frankly had to step down because their only perspective was that of a legal perspective and there can be issues where legally your company may be in the right you may not be breaking any laws but actually um, you may be on the wrong side of ESG reputationally what you've done may not look as good and that could actually have a bigger effect in in many ways on your company's well reputation with consumers your share price um you know indeed scrutiny from politicians or or other regulators um and i think that you know that you know going back to your initial point with the acc survey um we're seeing the remit of many general counsel really explode and in the fortune 500 I, I live and work in the us now some of the gcs have you know five six seven eight departments you know they have thousands of people who are reporting to them and the majority of them may not be lawyers anymore but it is interesting that the general counsel the chief legal officer is being seen as almost the um the logical uh, business executive to deal with that and I think that's partly because lawyers um, you know we, we may sometimes focus a lot on um, you know uh, that lawyers can get very siloed in their thinking um, but actually um, lawyers also have an amazingly expansive way of thinking and able to look at things you know you are all trained to consider a number of points of view you know you are trained in negotiations to consider the point of the view of the other side or you know if you're a litigator the point of view of the other side um, you are looking at, at a number of different perspectives and you are able to weigh things up very well and in an in-house company as I'm sure many of the audience will know the legal department can have a an, probably one of the most unrivaled overviews of all of the business functions and what is going on and, and let me uh... Lead, that leads to my next question. That what could, from the lot of research that you've done on this subject, a lot of general counsels and in-house teams that you have interacted with, what, do you have some suggestions? What are the things in-house counsels can do to develop the skills and mindset that is required to, 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 to approach business thinking? Well, I think there's a, a number of things you can do. I mean, I would I would generally say that the best thing to start with is purpose. Um, there's a very famous book by Simon Sinek, which I reference in, in my book called Start With Why. And that's a very easy read. There's a great um, video on YouTube of him talking about um, this concept of starting with why, which is like 10 minutes. So it's a great thing to just show to your team. Um, and you know when you think about why does your legal department exist why are we here that can be very transformative in terms of then actions that can cascade out of that um you know and i think that many of the examples that i cite in my book and, and organizations that i work with now the success is coming from people really having an understanding of why are we here and perhaps why is our function changing and how does it change and actually what we were doing five years ago may not may no longer be fit for purpose and having that adaptability um, I think another key point is the connection point and talking to your business stakeholders as much as possible and I'm aware that in some companies um, as we've discussed it can be challenging some Indian companies can be um, quite hierarchical and maybe it's not as easy to 
particularly get your team's uh, connections with the business. Um, I think that there are some ways that, you know, I've seen general counsel approach this. Um, so, for example, I've seen a number of general counsel approach this as a learning opportunity. So asking a business colleague, you know, would you be able to help me with a developmental opportunity for my team? Could they sit in on some of your business strategy meetings and listen? Um, and generally, I think, you know, people are always flattered to feel that they are the arbiters of knowledge. Um, and, you know, people generally, most people do like to help others out. So sort of appealing to business colleagues, um, better natures and actually being a little bit vulnerable can be a great way to to start to get some insights and uh, and, and also yeah, I think these are some great suggestions and more so I must say, uh, I see, uh, I, I know of at least one client that I work with in, in India and they say what they've started doing is they send their lawyers from the in-house team on some sort of an internal sequenment. So the lawyers sit with the business teams uh, and do non-lawyer work just to learn the ropes. So, so some experiments going on, but some great suggestions there. That's a great uh, my, next question, my next question for you, Dr. McGregor, is uh, all this is, uh, you know, this is all aspirational. We must do, everyone should do, and this is where the world is headed. And to stay ahead of the curve, uh, it seems like a must to have an attitude of business thinking. But what are the key impediments you see? Uh, I have not met general counsels who don't buy into this. Everyone seems to be fully aligned with the idea that this ought to be implemented across the teams. People should have a business hat and business thinking. But what is the impediment in your mind? What are the key impediments that you see? Uh, and how can one overcome these impediments? Yeah, I think that the biggest impediment is probably just busyness and, you know, the volume of work that people are having to deal with and, you know, almost being able to see um, the wood for the trees or the trees for the wood, which I know is an analogy we're going to say, but, the, um, but being able to take the time and the space to actually strategize um, and think about things and not just get caught in reactiveness. And of course, you know, I think as most people on this call will, will realize that, you know, um, when you're working in a law firm versus a legal department, you know, you're uh, your practice is, is really based on being reactive for your clients. And I think that many lawyers in-house get trapped in that same reactiveness. And you have, may have very demanding business clients who want everything yesterday. Um, I think that, you know, I'm seeing more and more legal departments realize that they have to push back against that to some extent and understand you know, triage work in terms of the urgency and the business value and look at other solutions, whether that's outsourcing the low value, low cost work, uh, low priority work, or using, helping getting technology solutions to help with that. But really trying to keep the in-house lawyers more focused on the high value strategic work. And, and you certainly see that in the DXC um, examples, but but also even within the Crown Estate, who had a very tiny legal team. Actually, there were only about seven of them in the in the legal team. They weren't massive, um, but you know, figuring out ways that uh, you know they could be um, more strategic and and less just responsive without having that space or time to be strategic. Um, one piece of advice that I give um, every general counsel that I coach is, you know, try and claw back at least a couple of hours of week, keep it in your diary as sacrosanct to just do some thinking. Try not, you know, do not let other meetings get in that space because that will be incredibly valuable to you um, to get a perspective on what your department is doing and what you need to do. And you'd be surprised at how many successful CEOs do that. Um, I've heard of successful CEOs who are, you know, having four or five hours a week that their uh, assistants are keeping free of anything so that they can get that nece necessary time and space. And, you know, I do think that that cannot be undervalued when you're in a legal leadership position that you need to allow yourself um, the time and space to think and strategize. 
some great suggestions there. Do you have, uh, maybe, but my next question is that if one wanted to achieve this, how does one break down the silos in organizations, particularly around the in-house team and other parts of business to facilitate business thinking? I know you have studied numerous organizations and you've seen how legal teams have achieved this. So we thought we'll get some suggestions from you uh, on, on things which can be implemented to break down these silos. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've talked before about the collaboration part and I think it's often, you know, some of the suggestions that we've talked about, trying to use the comments, trying to get business uh, stakeholders in to talk to your legal team about what they do, trying to foster um, that dialogue. Um, you know, it could also be as a starting point, you know, making, uh, you know, asking your direct reports or your key in-house lawyers to engage with their key business stakeholders and ask questions such as, you know, um, what are your strategic priorities um, as a business leader over the next year? How can we help with those? And, you know, are there things we should start doing? Are there things that we should stop doing? So having that sort of high level um, scene setting uh, conversation with business stakeholders can be very helpful in sort of opening up a whole other uh, mode of connection with them where it can give you as the general counsel some great insights into potential um, strategy avenues, potential uh, direction or focus for uh, your legal team strategy over the next um, over the next 12 months. I think also, you know, being able to look at what other legal teams are doing, particularly, you know, not necessarily confined to your sector, but you know, particularly in your sector, if you've um, that can be a very good way of, you know, getting um, getting buy-in from, say, your CEO or other key executives. If it, if you see there are certain things that say competitor legal teams are doing that you are not, that fear of, of missing out, fear of being left out, fear of being left behind, um, might well then make them more amenable to um, give buy-in to particular changes or ideas you want to introduce. And, and in your book, you again talk a great deal about culture of organizations. And mm -hmm. I would imagine, and I would appreciate your views that to be able to implement these changes, how important is the culture of the organization and is there something that the legal team could do uh, to influence uh, if the culture is against uh, against the tide against the changes they want to implement yeah no I think I think that's very um, you know the culture is increasingly important and I do think that the general counsel and the legal team now have an increasingly important part um, in influencing the culture of an organization um, and I think that you know many organizations are realizing that you know post Me Too, post George Floyd that culture actually does have an impact on the bottom line and productivity and indeed we started talking about talent um, can have a massive uh, massive effect on talent um, recruiting and retention um, so I think that the culture piece is incredibly important for uh, for in-house lawyers to be part of. I mean, fundamentally, what you need to do is to start with a bit of an analysis of your culture. Um, if you're um, if you've been through a recent crisis issue that may have a culture aspect to it, that's a perfect time to get buy-in from your executive suite to do a little bit more of a culture analysis which could indeed be led by the um, by the legal team um, I don't think that the culture of your legal team can ever true you know can be at odds with your organization if you are you do have a, a significant problem there um, in terms of compliance but um, my culture case study in the book focused on Pearson's legal team under the leadership of Bjarne Tellman who's quite an inspirational general counsel um, and it's interesting that the work they did focused very much on what is legal here to do and how can it help 
um, shore up the culture of Pearson and ultimately make it more successful. Um, and a big part of what they were doing with that was through um, actual transparency and accountability in the legal team. And their work became actually very influential to Pearson as an organization. They actually led the way on this. And Pearson is, um, you know, a, a company that has actually, you know, in common with many other companies, been built up through a number of acquisitions, which of course means you can end up with a certain amount of natural silos. Um, you can also end up with, you know, a bit of a mish, mish, ma, mishmash of culture because you have companies that may have their own cultures being sort of bolted together. So the legal departments work on actually determining what was the uniqueness of the culture that legal had and how it really impacted, um, you know, the, the efficacy of the culture of Pearson inspired the wider organization to do a lot more work on their culture um, and a lot of the focus in the legal work on culture was interestingly because these things are never siloed are they interestingly did focus a lot on the talent piece that, that we started with Anuj because it was around transparency it was around making people feel valued giving them opportunities to feel that they could be more and and, and grow within their opportunities within the legal department. And, and, and let me ask a question, Dr. Mike Reger, then. What happens in a situation, and I don't know if you've come across this question before, uh, what happens if an organization where the culture is not just quite right, then how does, what are the options for the in-house counsel? Well, I think um, serious conversations with uh, key stakeholders is needed, and I think um, you know, if there are consistent cultural um, issues, um, you've got to look at the ramifications of that. And, you know, often um, culture failures um, can be an issue, frankly, around leadership. It's not always the executive leadership. A lot of research has shown that it's often around middle management where uh, the challenges lie more. The people who are sort of on the front line of managing the most people. Um, and I think that the lawyers can often, you know, see that um, because, you know, you may be, your employment lawyers may be seeing that there are particular themes coming up within workplace complaints and so forth. Um, I think that that's, um, you know, that is a way to have a discussion. But again, if you are trying to frame things, framing it in the bigger picture business mindset is that's where this becomes invaluable. Um, when you're trying to um, take your seat at the table, have conversations with key executives to be able to say, look, this is not just a matter of niceness. This is a matter of actual profit because companies, um, you know, companies in the US, for example, lose um, collectively lose one trillion dollars a year through bad leadership because of the attrition of staff the cost of training new staff, the cost of, you know, potential workplace um, workplace cases. So there's an actual, you know, effect on the bottom line, and that is probably going to get both your CEO and your CFO quite focused in a way that we need to be a nice company, may not. Well, oh, I can't agree with you more uh, on that. And, and that leads me to my next question. And this is, again, we get asked uh, in offline conversations which we have with our GC clients is how do we manage our traditional responsibilities with the need to think and act like business leaders and what are the strategies for managing this tension? I think that one thing is try and get try not to see it as an either or and most of the uh, general counsel that I had case studies on in my book and some of the others that I interviewed said it was very transformative of them to realize that it's not about not being a lawyer. Being a lawyer is the essential part of your toolkit, but you're just layering this. It's more about framing your perspective differently. 
it's not necessarily about taking on more and more work. And if you uh, many of the case studies like the Crown Estate, like the NatWest case study, the Schlumberger case study, even when there's a transformation taking part, um, they've always got in their mind that it's actually going to make things more effective and more efficient and more um, conducive to working uh, with the business. But that the starting point is having a change in mindset and realizing that the the traditional uh, lawyer, um, you know, uh, activities don't have to stop. It's almost just the way you approach them and think about, um, you know, how you're doing them. So, for example, um, you know, uh, Schlumberger, um, who I talk about in regards to talent, their uh, transformation in their legal department encompassed a lot more. But what was um, very transformative for them was realizing that as a legal team, they were sitting on a lot of quite valuable business insights that were not being shared with the wider business. And actually mining for that data, mining for those wider business insights, such as, you know, we are doing X number of contracts a month. What are the clauses that the sales department is always getting held up on? Are there things that we're leaving on the table? Are there, are there sort of bigger trends we're seeing in terms of what we should be doing more of? So taking that ability to take the oversight that the lawyer has and bring that to the table is, I think, um, you know, incredibly valuable in, man, you know, not seeing it as a tension. And it may be helpful to think about it in terms of a metaphor, a bit like the telescope, that you maybe have the detail um, of being a lawyer, but then you're also able to zoom out and bring the big picture view of the, the business partner as well. You have uh, some great insights again, and I'm mindful of the time. Uh, and what I wanted to do, in fact, this was a question which we have on our list, and I see uh, a few questions also being asked from the audience on the same thing, which is how will AI impact the role and function of in-house teams in a business thinking context? And how should in-house teams adapt in consequence? And again, there's a lot of discussion uh, I see within in-house teams uh, on how AI is going to disrupt uh, or give new opportunities of ways of doing business. And, and I, I know you've examined this at length and it will be great to have your perspective on that. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I, my my book was written um, before the the um, explosion of ChatGPT and all of these new technologies. But I think that it's still um, actually what I'm talking about in the book is even more relevant because of the advent of of increasing use of AI. I think what we're going to see is that many of the uh, you know uh, lower value, um, high commoditized tasks that lawyers undertook are going to be taken on increasingly by AI. Um, having said that, um, this need to be more business focused is going to be what sets in-house legal teams and their leaders and their lawyers apart. So realizing you know, that bigger picture point of view and how it connects to the business is what's going to um, essentially be the the skills that, that are seen as very golden by, by your business executives. Um, but frankly as well, I think we also need to remember that, and, and I was just reading yesterday um, an interview in Harvard Business Review with a software engineer at Goldman Sachs who said that it's incredibly important um, in all this um, you know, rush to AI to not forget that the human strategy skills are what is going to become increasingly key in defining the success of the application of AI. So what I actually see um, in many legal departments I'm working with is a bit of a panic from some general counsel with almost this, oh my goodness, we've got to get AI, we've got to get some kind of AI, without actually taking that step back and considering the why what are, what are we going to be asking AI to do? Have we worked out all the questions that we want AI to answer? And you know, when we find a use case for it, 
do we have the time and resource to put into ensuring that the AI is trained and managed in the right way? Because this stuff is amazing, but it does need guidance because otherwise it produces these hallucinations or goes off on its own. And I think we, we, we may have all come across the, the famous case a few months ago where some lawyer used um, AI to come up with case precedents and the AI started making up cases that it thought should fit the president as opposed to real ones. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword and I think it will throw more opportunities than risks, but it is inevitable and people will need to continue to be agile and uh, go along. I'm going to skip a few questions that I had. I'm going to pick uh, one of these uh, interesting questions which has been asked uh, uh, in the chat box, which is how? Do, what can in-house teams do to cease from being perceived as the department of no? I know you use this term in your book as well. Uh, yeah. the department, what and somebody's asked this question, so so I thought I'll I, I'll pick this one and ask you that what are your suggestions for in-house teams on things that they can do to ensure that they're not perceived as the department of no? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, if you want to try, you know, maybe you're historically the in-house team has been perceived as the department of, of no. And if you want to do a bit of a reset on that, I think the best way to start is by talking to key stakeholders and, and really almost setting up this is what the function of this is what I, as the general counsel, see as the function of the in-house team being, and how can we work together more effectively to achieve your goals? And the most, um, so many of the general counsel that I feature in my book, um, whether they're case studies or whether they're just quoted, they're very much coming in with the mindset that they are talking to key business stakeholders and trying to understand as much as possible um, what the end goal is, as opposed to what the specific distinct legal question that they or the team may have been asked with at that moment. Okay, um, you know, you know, you want this particular type of term in your contract, or you want to structure a business in this particular way, which is a bit unique and novel. But can you tell me what the purpose of this is? Because that will allow the lawyers to come in with their problem solving hats on and really it's also to get a uh, build a certain amount of trust with your business stakeholders to be able to get them to see that uh, okay the original way you wanted to do it may actually be illegal or inadvisable for various reasons but that if I understand where you want to get to perhaps I can find an alternative route that actually is uh, more viable and actually may end up being a bit of better business solution for you. So again, there's a big theme on talking to the business, but really understanding what are their objectives and their their key drivers. So again, you know, using that um, influencing um, ability to to be able to as much as possible. Um, get a seat at the table in the earlier strategy discussions and and that that may not come immediately but the more when i've worked with general counsel who've needed to make this change the more that you're coming in to have the discussions and asking questions from a a sort of and also the way you ask the question can be very key so not sort of why do you want to do this but more i'm just really interested in in why is this happening can you please just to, you know, from a sense of open curiosity and inquiry, as opposed to, um, you know, um, a sense of, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm perhaps, uh, you know, uh, awesome. judging you on why you want to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I, I hope the person who asked the question found it valuable. I, I, I did, I, I did, and I hope uh, you know the query was well answered. I'm totally mindful of the time, and this is perhaps the last question I'll take. Uh, from the chat box, which is why is the ability to fail or fail fast and learn important to building culture in a legal team? I think uh, so. It's interesting that all of the legal teams that I, not, a lot of the legal teams that I uh, focus on in the book in terms of case studies like the Crown Estate, NatWest. 
um, Schlumberger, um, uh, DXC, um, and Pearson, they um, were undergoing some kind of transformation. And actually what is very central to transformation is a culture where people feel psychologically safe and central to psychological safety is the ability to feel that you can get things wrong. Um, you know, not, I mean, obviously, if you keep getting things wrong, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, sometimes when you're going to try something new, you do not have a, a guarantee of success. And the, the term, you know, fail, fail fast is one that's come from the technology industry where, you know, things do need to be iterated and tried out. Things are new. They may not work the first time, but you will learn from what did not work. Um, and I think that that consistent, you know, learning, you know, okay, we didn't, we did it something a certain way and it didn't work out is, is incredibly important because that is increasingly happening in business as, as innovation increases. We're going to see, going back to the point about AI, um, the law doesn't quite know how to deal with a lot of this stuff now. Probably, you know, 75% of businesses globally are thinking about introducing AI, probably everyone in this call is going at some point to have to grapple with some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, legal issue that won't um, have a precedent, that there won't be a law written yet to deal with it. So that ability of, you know, people feeling that they can explore, innovate, take chances is going to become increasingly, increasingly um, important. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's interesting that the um, some of the biggest corporate culture failures and, and indie corporate failures have come within cultures where people feel they cannot fail. Um, and then the stakes become too high and things that were perhaps a minor failure get covered up. And I, I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember the uh, the failure of Bearings Bank in the early 90s. Um, I actually saw Nick Leeson, the, the rogue trader, speak a few years ago. And he said that to him it was really a culture piece that he felt he would had been so successful, he felt unable to fail. And that when he made a small failure in a trade, he sort of, hid it away and then it just ballooned and then it became bigger and bigger. And I think that, you know, it all that comes to um, a compliance, a legal and compliance issue as well, that actually if we've got a culture where we feel all of our people, the lawyers and the business people, um, can speak up when something that doesn't go wrong or when they feel something's not quite right, that is going to make our companies even more robust robust and indeed legally compliant and in the book it's quite interesting that Nat West who are quite a creative the, the team I worked with were quite a creative legal team Thank they would actually bring in external speakers from you know they had a pilot, an airline pilot and a surgeon to specifically come in and speak to them about failure and obviously the uh, the failure if you're an airline pilot or a surgeon is is a much greater magnitude than presumably most mistakes that any lawyer could make so that you know how do you learn from failure and how do you deal with failure um, in those That's high stakes industries as a, as a learning tool for their lawyers right no, i'm going to i know we'll maybe end up running over a few minutes but we have this interesting question from kozam mirza at aditya birla so so we're going to spend very quickly i'll request you to react to it uh, which is how legal counsels normally have to balance, and most often it tilts towards business than legal. How do we bridge, how this bridge can be managed? I think the question is, most often the discussions are heavily tilted towards business, uh, and how do we manage uh, this tension and uh, keep it tilted towards legal? Um, is that in the, quest in the conversations with, um with business stakeholders. That's what. Yes. That's um, what it looks. Like. Well, I think I think again, it's maybe trying to dispel the tension between 
business and legal and realize that they're actually working in tandem and maybe representing that to the business stakeholders that actually if your ultimate goal is to get to um, a new you know a new business idea that is going to be profitable um, the legal is a tool to help you do that better because the ramifications if you don't have um, a legal, a legally viable solution are um, pretty cataclysmic, and actually, ultimately, that's going to affect your profitability. So, really, to sort of reframe the narrative in the fact that the legal is there not as attention, but but as a support, and that actually, um, you know, a good analogy could be that um, tension. Well, also as well, tension doesn't always need to be bad as long as it can move as well if you're trying to you know put a tent up you need tension but the tension has to work together as opposed to being being just tension so it's that sort of having the sense that you know there may be tension at points but ultimately we're trying to get to the same solution and i am using my uh my legal rigor and maybe i'm pushing back on you but just to make sure that we get to the absolute best solution as opposed to one that maybe isn't going to be as legally rigorous and ultimately will affect the business badly. No, i think some great thoughts and i think some of this resonate even for lawyers are like us who are in private practice but some great thoughts there with that being mindful of the time i'm quickly going to go to uh, next slide, which is where we give a quick up, quick summary of some of the key takeaways. Uh, I don't know if we have it on the slide, but if we don't, I'm willing to read out the three takeaways. The first one we are taking away is business thinking requires in-house councils to take a holistic view of the business they serve, align the culture of the legal team with the business teams, and understand and internalize the purpose of the organization. The second one is a successful in-house counsel has a sophisticated understanding of how all the risk of business overlap with the legal risk and will be able to strategize on the concerns of the wider, wider organization. And the third one is that collaboration is key. In-house counsel need to talk more to business stakeholders and move outside of their comfort zone to layer their perspective and becoming being more than just a lawyer. And with that, uh, our next slide is on a poll. Uh, as we near the conclusion of today's webinar, I'd like to kindly ask each of you to take a moment to share your feedback by responding to the poll slide on your screen. Your input is invaluable to us as we strive to continuous improvement, Mitesh, has already displayed the poll slide. We appreciate your uh, votes to this poll slide. All right, so some good, some good feedback for us. Uh, uh, we are we are we are happy that people found it worthwhile. Thank you for this. Great, thank you, everyone. And um, you know, um, I'm very happy um, uh, if if, um, if you do want to uh, get in touch, you know, to share my uh, contact details with anyone on the call if they would find them useful. Always happy to, um, you know, talk if you've got particular uh, problems or, or indeed ideas and just want to uh, brainstorm. Um, always happy to hear from uh, friends and, and colleagues in India. Sure. And very quickly, uh, you know, uh, Dr. McGregor, I wanted to Thanks the thank uh, extend my sincere gratitude to yourself for, for your insightful and informative contributions. We have to express our sincere appreciation for the attentive audience. I hope everyone found today's webinar both engaging and valuable, and a meaningful investment of your time. It's it's been our pleasure at Khatan and Company to bring this discussion to you. Following this webinar, you can expect to receive a copy of today's summary notes for your reference. Additionally, keep an eye out for a separate feedback request regarding the webinar experience. Your input 
comments, constructive criticism, or even compliments is invaluable to us. Uh, as Dr. McGregor said, her details are on the screen. Thank you once again for joining us today, and we eagerly anticipate connecting with you again for future in-house council forum sessions. Thank you.